didn't. I wish I did. Just tell me when we're good, Sandy. All I saw was that dark liquid, and I didn't know what it was. Excellent. We are back live at the Printiverse for our Cleansing Your Palette. Hello. The fresh, he's like the shining guy. He's like, you know, Jack Nicholson. He's through the curtain there. Um, cleansing Your Palette, the fresh taste of color. Uh, color has become very topical subject, uh, mostly because the manufacturers are talking a lot about new inks. The uh, paper companies are talking a lot about new substrates. And because of all the uh, new presses and the new opportunities with different varieties of them, color management has become a very hot topic in regard to not necessarily getting the best color out of one device, but how to make sure that all devices are working correctly with each other amongst themselves and also amongst net amongst networks of printers. Um, if I'm, I, my background, I am a print buyer. If I need to only send my job to one printer because that's the only person who can hit my color, that's a problem for me. I'm going to look for a network or a wider array of help so I have more flexibility as far as location, shipping, there's other costs, other factors, timing. Um, so color becomes a critical conversation, especially I used to work in the advertising agency, so we're talking about major brands. They don't mess around with their colors. Um, and Jim, as you explained to me once, the label on the Coca-Cola bottle has to match the display it's sitting on, has to match the signage on, on top of it, um, and has to ma match the shelf uh, tag in the uh, supermarket. And that is not all done at the same place. So how do we do that now in a, in the digital era, pretty much? Um, OK, so let's start with. Um, also, um, Canon, not really sure where they are at the moment, but if they pop in, they will sit in on the end there, and hopefully they will show up. Otherwise, their information is in your little brochures, and you can get in touch with them later and find out what they felt about any of these subjects. So uh, we're going to start with Muto, and um, I prefer to, even though you do have human names, I will call you by companies because, quite frankly, people remember that. Uh, m most of the time. So we're going to start with Muto, but you, I actually know you. You're Jim from Color Metrics, who's representing Muto. But why don't you tell uh, everybody a little bit about who you are, what you do, and about the color-related conversations you're having here at Graph Expo. Is this thing on? Yes. Oh, okay. oh and I'm sorry. You can pull it out uh, just to, yeah, that's perfect. All right, so I'm Jim Raffle, and I work with Muto in a capacity of helping them build their Color Verify product line, which is a combination of software louder. and tech. Talk louder. Talk louder? Yeah, perfect. I can do that. Um, I work with them building their Color Verify product line, which is a combination of software and other tools to basically achieve what we call a common visual appearance across all of their printing platforms. And that would be everything from UV printers, solvent printers, um, they do some textile work. I don't think I've missed anything. And all kinds of different ink sets. We, we roll that all together, and we make it look virtually the same when you, when you view it under proper lighting conditions. Perfect. HP. Thank you. So Tim Steffel from the Hewlett Packard Indigo family, uh, working with the commercial category products of Series 2 and Series 3. We call that the 5900 and 7900 products. And what that does with us is densitometers for the 5 Series, spectrophotometers for the 7 series and I've got things up here I can show you present to you but basically what it comes down to is the capability of printing on every single application the exact same color day after day week after week and I always use this in a demonstration I talk about an archer that you put you want to get for your Olympic team which archer would you rather have would you want the guy that shoots a tight pack of 10 arrows on the bottom left of the target misses the center target completely but all of his arrows are right in one little pack or do you want the guy that hits five out of those ten arrows dead center, maybe even Robin Hood's a couple, but the other five are way off the target? And you actually want the first guy, but what we do with the HP Indigo family is the spectrophotometer is going to give us the ability to target the overall, um, the middle of the target, 
but then also get that consistency that's going to be repeatable time after time. So that's going to be Pantone colors. That's going to be regular CMYK printing. That's going to be spot colors on an individual ink. So we do have the color gamut expansion colors, orange, violet, and green. I've got samples of those up here with me. Um, we're going to match the Pantone colors in spot colors, in process uh, CMYK builds, in the expanded gamut of orange, violet, green with CMYK, kind of anything you want. It all comes down to what your customers need and what they're willing to pay. Thanks so much. Xerox. Uh, my name is Mike Lacanina. Um, I actually spent about 30 years in engineering delivering the FreeFlow print server. I managed the uh, development of all the imaging technology, the color science, the color profiling. And I spent a lot of time traveling, working with customers, resolving their color issues. And I'll tell you, um, I spent my, most of my career knee deep in the core technology and the, really the challenge with color today is not the technology. Matter of fact, it's, I wouldn't call it the problem. It's actually pretty good, color profiling technology. It's really more about the workflow. And I consider the color workflow today, you sh and it is, it's archaic, it's outmoded, and it's in its infancy. And Xerox is out to reinvent how color management gets done. And the best color management workflow is the one that works for you automatically. So what I mean by that is closed loop process control for color is where this industry needs to go because to have to educate your operations people, the customers, that is where we need to take as little of your time as possible. What you want is a press that actually monitors itself and corrects itself automatically. So we'll talk about how to get there from here, but uh, many of our, matter of fact, our other uh, uh, vendors in the industry moving to include inline sensors into the process itself so that there's actually not manual interaction with measurement devices. The device actually collects its own measurement data and auto corrects. So um, I'm hoping to get a lot of questions on this, but right now, really color management needs to be redefined how it gets done at print time in order to meet this predictability. And in order to get predictability, you need to institute what every other manufacturer has done to get, whether it's a stick of gum or an airbag, to perform within specifications. You identify your acceptable tolerance. You are able to demonstrate you can repeat it. You monitor to make sure you can and to correct automatically when you need to. That's where color management is going to go, and that's actually where we've made some good first steps, and I hope to see other uh, vendors do the same. Thanks so much. And, Mike, if uh, moving forward, if you could just speak louder into the microphone. Oh, sure. People are having a hard okay. time hearing you. Okay. Uh, we're going to start off. Um, rumor has it Canon's on the way, by the way. Okay. Oh, okay. So there's fluorescent ink. There's white ink. There's ink that turns color with heat. There's security ink. There's the Canon guy. All right. So let's, let's start with you. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do and about the color conversations you're having over in the Canon booth. And thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, DJ Montalto, uh, I'm a technical analyst at headquarters on the marketing side of the house. Uh, it's a really odd title. You say I'm a technical analyst. It's somewhat redundant. Um, generally speaking, my tasking is uh, identify a problem and identify a solution. Find a way to resolve things uh, that fall within a customer's ability and desire. It's not so much, you know, here's the ideal solution, but here's what we can do. Um, that's a big piece of it. Mostly on the color discussions that we're having, generally speaking, uh, I live in, uh, I'll have to say, the semi-theoretical color management universe where we're having conversations about expanded gamut. Uh, I'm on the Grackle committee, so I get some conversations there with what's happening in there. That's why I'm late, I'm sorry. Uh, as well as uh, one of my core areas of focus is the G7 calibration piece and why we brought that to the digital front end the way we did and the benefits we're seeing for customers there. Thanks so much. Yep. So back to the question. There's fluorescent ink, white ink, ink that turns colors with heat, security inks. Why this sudden surge in ink options and what ink opportunities are available specifically with your equipment? And Jim, I can, if you can handle, okay, go. Because you're representing MUTO, but you're actually a color management expert. So with the MUTO equipment, the two areas that you mentioned that they probably have at least equipment on the floor that it represents is, is the white. And the reason for white ink is actually um, 
relatively straightforward. It's used primarily in, in Muto's case in their UV line, but there, there's an exception to that, but in their UV line, you can essentially print like on a piece of um, plastic, like plexi plexiglass, and you would, you would put down your four color first in reverse print, and then you would put the white behind it. So in essence, your white becomes the substrate, although the substrate actually might be the, the LED or other lighting that is then behind it to backlight it. So, um, so white has a bunch of applications. It can go down over, you know, can go down over black so that your four color is, is uh, more vibrant and uh, you know, kind of jumps off whatever it's on, or it can also be used on a, on a glass or plexiglass as your substrate, and then and you can backlight from there. And then the other thing that they've, they've got here today on their little, um, the little six, 628 24-inch wide printer, they've got, I think that actually has white loaded in it now too, but that's a uh, eco-solvent printer, but they've got some metallic ink loaded up in that. And that's, that's really cool because with the right software um, and tools, you can do some really, really cool things with just one additional ink color that just essentially just makes things like pop off the page. And I, and I think that's, that's what we're talking about with all these ink technologies is, is our competition isn't across this table, it's, it's across the digital spectrum. It's, it's with other screen, you know, basically other digital technology than print technology, screens, um, whatever else it might be. Thanks so much, HP. Sure, so our inks literally come down to a wide range of capabilities from orange, violet, and green that I talked about before that gives us the gamut expansion. That gives us all of the Pantone colors on press, minus fluorescence and metallics. I'm sorry, are those digital breakdowns of the Pantone colors or yes, the actual? Okay. But we do both. So okay. we do have the gamut expansion on press that gives us orange, violet, and green. I've got the whole Pantone book behind me. Um, feel free to come up and look at it after. But let's say you needed reflex blue. Well, you can either do reflex blue with violet, cyan, and black overlapping, or because it's faster and you get a better color match against that actual color, with no screen, no dots, you actually put in reflex blue in the press, and you do that as a black and, and reflex blue job. It's two colors. It runs twice the speed of a four-color job, half the cost, etc. So there's a lot of advantages to the capability with the five and six and seven color printing. But we also add in fluorescent pink, white ink, a clear ink, we have um, the thermograph, thermographic type capability where we're going to increase the, the thickness of the material um, for the tactile feel uh, on the material. Photo applications, light magenta, light cyan, all of those things are built into all of our products. So from the start of the product line with the 5900 all the way up through the 7900 and the 12,000, we're going to give each of those presses the ability to, to spread the gamut and spread the, uh, the application capabilities. But at the um, color side of it, we're looking specifically with that spectrophotometer feature, being able to calibrate and keep all of those colors in line, specifically built for that expanded gamut orange, violet, green. Thanks so much. Xerox. So uh, the Xerox product line, uh, and particularly being led by, obviously led by iGen, we have our orange, green, and our, our blue technology to get our expanded spot color support but it also includes the expanded gamut for things like Adobe RGB. And I'll tell you, uh, we're working very closely with customers to get full use not only for spot colors, which is obviously uh, a big part of our market. Matter of fact, we focused on hitting brand colors with our expanded gamut. But we're also able to in really give uh, customers uh, that ability to make use of these highly, uh, let's say, cherished images the workflow doesn't always really keep, for instance, an Adobe RGB or a camera raw RGB image where if a graphic designer gets all this beautiful design content, it's not making it onto paper because they need to understand the workflow from pre-press to press. So Xerox is helping our customers to really use things like the Creative Suite to take full advantage of these expanded gamuts because we're really finding a lot of our customers, even if they have equipment in the field today, aren't really fully utilizing the capability of an expanded gamut device. Um, and I'll tell you, it's part of it is the native PDF print engine and understanding, coordinating its settings with the, the creative uh, suite has really become one of our key elements of getting our customer to do what we call the total print condition. So they understand from creative to print, 
to get a faithful representation on how to actually make full use of this expanded gamut with, again, the, uh, the orange, the green, and the blue. We also provide uh, clear uh, coating. We do silver and gold. Those are really more for highlights. There's really not so much a color management issue there because you're not doing blends with a gold or a silver. Uh, it's really more about making it use of those highlights uh, to really have the biggest impact. So um, really we're focusing on not only delivering the technology to actually print, print these, but to actually incorporate a workflow from end to end, again, this total print condition, to faithfully uh, and really take full advantage of the investment. Thanks. Kenan. So it's kind of difficult to answer that question in any one, pr one product family, because uh, we have an incredibly wide portfolio. So we'll start with the 12 color world, right? Um, I have a 12 color printer. How do I take advantage of that? Like you were saying with the total workflow and depending on the use case, we have some artists who I'm really working in Photoshop and just export straight from Photoshop directly to the printer. The print data comes is, is interpreted then. And now we're actually using it like a seven channel device where you have RGB parts, parts A and part magenta to, to handle your gamut expansion there. So on that side of the universe, gamut expansion is really the, it's kind of the low bar <laughs> for, for the audience we're talking to. When you get into some of the other technology, you get into high-speed inkjet or uh, electrophotography, then you start looking at where are your pigments. So you can expand gamut a couple of ways. You can add in five, six, seven, or you can start working with high pigment densities, um, which are, by the way, the, the fundamental like argument, not argument, discussion we're having in uh, the Grackle subcommittee on how we're handling that. And increasing pigment gives you one kind of gamut expansion. Increasing density gives you another kind of gamut expansion. The trick here is to not alienate our friends in the offset world because they need to run parallel to what we're doing. We do the short run, they do the long run from digital side. So you start to look at that part of the puzzle. How do we keep those pieces running at speed and consistency starts to become the, the next part of the discussion. And the full workflow. How are you taking advantage of your PDF workflow to its best advantage? And what are the tools that are there? You know, that's that's another long part of where we see we ask people we get people asking us for I need more color out of this device. And now we have to go back and diagnose um, that you're artificially clipping your color before you got it to the device. So now let's talk about that part of the equation. So gamut expansion it falls in this 50-50 world for me. Part of it is the technology itself that we offer and the pigments that are available and, and or dyes and available in the inks in the products where you, that's not an option to change those out. Now we start after looking at uh, how are you doing, what are you doing. Thanks. And I'm just going to mix this up, um, picking on people to answer. So. <laughs> Uh, the question is, how have your customers been able to differentiate themselves with color? Can you share any success stories? So, HP, let's start with you. Sure, I'll actually take you back a couple years, to be honest. Um, we know at the shows like we have here at trade shows, people give away little tchotchkes, and the brand color that you need to be able pr to produce has to be different and unique for each and every single customer that's at a show like this. So we had a customer, if you remember them a few years ago, a company called Presalite. And what it was was a little squeeze thing that you squeeze. It was inside a little plastic um, container. And when you squeezed it, the light turned on on the end. Well, if you went around to trade shows, they had a little bowls in front of all of the different brands. And they'd have, you know, a couple hundred of these little lights. Well, if you look at how big it is, you put like 40 or 50 of them on a single sheet and then wrap them inside this light. So if the company ordered 2,000, that's like a few, maybe 10 or 15 sheets worth of printing, depending on the size of them. But you had to do one for each and every company that manufactured these. So you're not going to manufacture a single Pantone color for each and every company that you service. You're going to have three or four or 500 customers that you deal with on a trade show like this. You have to be able to do all those Pantones immediately. So with a seven color press, like I've said for the last couple of answers, you put orange, violet, and green in the press. You do the whole entire range of Pantone colors right on one device, and you print these press lights for everybody that needs them. And you can hit, hit their actual brand color, whether it's Coca-Cola red, John Deere green, or Motorola gray, or all these different values, because you're expanding the gamut. And we do those all at the same time. And the idea is that you don't want to have to be taking a color off the press, putting a color back on the press. Yes, if you do have an issue where you're doing a lot, like if you go back for this last summer, we had Coca-Cola that did the It's Mine application. 
And if you looked at the bottles, it was the, the first time that they brought back the glass bottles in a number of years. And we wrapped them with a lot of our vendors. We wrapped them with a product called Mosaic. So we shrink sleeved the material, wrapped it around the bottle, and every single bottle of the 16 million bottles was completely unique. Well, every single bottle had to have Coca-Cola Red. That label had to be Coke Red Ink. Hmm. So we made a five color capability wow. with all of the presses that service that market for 16.7 million bottles. Coca-Cola Red plus regular four color for the rest of the product. Amazing. I never, I, I love that mosaic job, but I never realized though that the Coca-Cola Red was, was the Coca-Cola Red. Amazing. Uh, Xerox, same question. I'm, I'm actually going to reference uh, two customer success stories, uh, and uh, one of them is actually easily accessible on Xerox.com, but one is in photo printing. A lot of our successes really evolve around the cost to quality. So uh, that includes high-end photo printing where we're able to do a, basically the margin on the, uh, on the ability to deliver these prints at the quality that really uh, rivals m far more expensive technology. Matter of fact, a company in the Netherlands, uh, really they're moving from uh, off even dye sublimation as far as where they're able to get cl far closer to the quality on different media. Um, and really to a real advantage. And then on the other side, Xerox is making a big investment in the inkjet world, so not all success stories have to be high-end graphic arts type applications. Um, in the inkjet world, business color, uh, there's really no obvious reference standard. It's not like uh, Swap or Fogra inks or even Grackle Digital, wherever where you are, you're really working with the ability to reproduce uh, consistently and in some cases matching different devices. So we're working with customers so that they're getting predictable color even off of what we would call some of the business or high volume inkjet devices. So what we see is Xerox really incorporating a lot more uh, uh, consistency across the fleet and really giving a better idea of what's achievable with respect to created pieces because you know we've got creative people working in uh, let's say Illustrator and InDesign and obviously going to another completely uh, different marking technology than let's say uh, toner or ink uh, standard ink processes there's different design considerations so we're really able to get we're working with the customer really to get their entire fleet of uh, inkjet presses whether they be uh, Xerox or not working consistently across each other and uh, although each are far more stable, being able to monitor to make sure that run, those long runs, appear cr accurate month to month. So uh, that was probably one of our biggest uh, biggest value adds as far as uh, in the last 12 months when it comes to color. Thanks, Kenan. Um, this is going to sound like a weasel answer. I don't think I'm going to be allowed to name drop, so uh, I'll have to describe these outside of a specific name. That's as, quite all uh, right. We, we understand Canada. <laughs> I figured, sorry. Uh, the, the, the number of ways that we get customers differentiating themselves with color, um, we actually have some of our customers advertising. And I, I'm an old guy. I remember um, when we used to have the big sign that we gave to people when they bought our copy, you know, Canon color copy inside. And, and, We've got a number of folks who still reference that and they still really promote that identity. The, the brand identity built around that has brought us partially to where we are on, on the EP side of the house and the whole wide variety of EP. When we get into the Arizona family and the things that they do there, it's, there's such an incredible variety of pieces that they run in that flatbed. I, I can't even... I almost can't begin to tell you everything from the point of purchase displays to the maps to the charts to the city of New York doing things that you see all over the place. It's just amazing and knowing that that came off of our devices and differentiates themselves. You know, oftentimes it's almost, there, I don't want to say that there's no competition, but the competition is really not as prevalent in some of those segments. Um, when you get into the wide format inkjet pieces, um, the Pro Series is absolutely differentiating itself with those 12 color systems, especially in the photography universe. I, I can't I don't think we could have made a bigger splash by releasing those products um, this year. So it's almost uh, difficult to say where we don't. 
Um, one place that I'm particularly familiar with on our side is the, the media handling capacity and that constant visual appearance that by, again, working with your customers to teach them how to use the workflow, understanding where G7 can really save their world. Sorry, I'm a G7 guy, it's kind of my thing. Um, and how to line up what they're doing and now shift their short volume, high profit work off offset press that they may have been break even or lose before and bring it over to an EP process uh, and some of the varieties of paper they didn't think they could run and educating them on that piece of the, you know, because paper still is the fifth color, um, no matter what everyone else says oh, on you expanded still might, gamut. you still one of my questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's my, it's part of my thing. Uh, <laughs> I like paper. It's, and that's really where we like, where we see a lot of expansion helping our customers uh, differentiate themselves. Thanks, Jim. Muto? So, with Muto, they have, they have this color verified product line that interfaces with um, their onboard spectra photometer, which just means a color measuring device that can be attached to the printer. And that's, that's the product line we help them with. They have a customer who has one of their printers with this device and didn't quite know how to use the software, which does generate G7 calibrations. So they asked me to work with this guy. So I went and worked with this guy. So he's got one of their 1628 printers. We get that all calibrated to G7, which means it's got really good gray balance. We build a nice profile on top of that, and building custom profiles doesn't have to be scary. Um, I think that's a really important message to get out there because that's how you get really great color out of any of what we're talking about is with the custom profile for your individual shop. And then he looked at it and he said, well, this is great. How do I, how do, I duplicate this on all the other equipment in this shop? And that's the cool thing about Muto's Color Verify product line is you can then, you can plug in an I1 instrument, which is a handheld instrument, and you can use that same tool to generate G7 calibrations and then using the correct RIP, build custom profiles for all your devices. And so basically by, by showing this guy how easy it was to build a custom profile that got him the color he wanted on one device, their device, um, he was then able to actually bring the whole rest of his shop into G7 compliance and basically can now shift work around between ink, pro between ink, ink types, UV, and, and, and everything and essentially get the same look on, on a job that crosses all those medias. Thanks so much. And um, every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, I host Print Chat on Twitter. And we have um, crowdsourced a bunch of questions from from the print chatters who are printers, who are your potential customers. So that we find it's very important to represent their questions. So this question, I'm actually going to start with you, Jim, if you don't mind. And I've alluded to it a little in the beginning when we started the panel. Is it really possible to match color across all devices, across networks? And does all the equipment have to be from the same manufacturer? That was the biggest question. So let's start with you, Jim. I'm sure it's a big question, but try to just try not to get too technical. Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to break it down. So the short answer is, I'm not a huge fan of the word match. I'm a, a much bigger fan of the phrase common visual appearance, which on the surface sounds like a cop out, but the guy at the other other, other end of the table knows exactly what I'm talking about. What it means BJ. is that what it means is when we look at these prints, no matter what the media, no matter what the ink set, as long as we're talking about CMYK for color, and we step back at a distance and we we basically um, allow our eye to adjust for the fact that they have different white points and things like that. We look at them and we go, "Gosh, these these really look the same." But that kind of feeds into what I brought up here. So I got this little thing, and it's going to probably be kind of hard to see, but those two patches right there probably look like two different colors right now. And that tells me that the lighting in here is not proper lighting to be looking at color. So if to, to achieve that common visual appearance, I have to be looking at these things under controlled lighting. And the reason why is UV inks have different colorants in them than dye sublimation inks, than eco-solvent inks. And that's pretty much what's happening right here. We've got two inks that under daylight, if we walked outside, these, these two patches would look, they would blend together and it would look like one patch. And here, under whatever we've got, sodium or something, they appear as, as two, two colors. So to, to, the short answer to your question is you can do it. You can definitely achieve this common visual appearance across devices, across manufacturers. It, it was the answer to my previous question. But it requires that there, you have to do what I call minimize the variables. 
and one of the variables is your lighting. And it's probably one of the biggest variables in that, in that scenario. And then you have to use a calibration method like G7 that gets all of those devices to a common gray point. I think you used the, the target example before. The cool thing about G7 is it's a known target. It's the middle of that bullseye. And if I just keep hitting it over and over and over again, I know that I'm always at the same starting point. Um, other forms of linearization, depending on manufacturers, I'm talking about rips here, they hit different places and they don't always hit them consistently. It's not a bad thing, it just means that it's not a known good print condition. So G7 gets us to a known good print condition and then we put this custom profile over the top of that and that's how we basically achieve a, a pretty good match to answer, to answer your question. Thanks. Does anybody have anything to add to that? <laughs> if you want to. Yeah. So just looking at it from HP Indigo's perspective, we've done a couple, a couple things to make it a site-based function. We have a tool called PrintOS, um, and what PrintOS does is it cloudifies the print network. So I have my phone. Everybody knows that they have a smartphone. They have all kinds of apps on it. And there's a billion apps that are coming that we're talking about being available from web to print to MIS to imposition to variable data, all these kinds of things. But one of the features of PrintOS is that it'll take a network, and if you have multiple sites that are connected to the same PrintOS account, you can share the same color data between two sites. So we have a number of customers that are connecting in and we have print brokers, one of which is Gelato, if you've heard the term. It's an online job fulfillment company. And what they did is they went out to a number of our vendors and said, I want to print through you. I don't want to buy Indigo Presses. I don't want to get into the printing business, but I do want to sell print. But I need to make sure that my products and my brand and everything is consistent straight across the network. So what PrintOS does, is it takes the initial reading off the spectrophotometer, which by the way, the spectrophotometer, just like we've been talking about, white points all the different media, all the different papers, it saves all that information, and that information gets shared with PrintOS, and then PrintOS with multiple sites connecting to the same account can share that data between sites. So then what that does is all you have to do between the two sites is get the same paper. So then they'll use the same paper, the press will work around its own internal environment, adjust for color, adjust for inks, it does its own internal profiling, and we've got um, boards over at the booth that we can show you where we've done prints from multiple sites around the world, totally different presses, even totally different levels of presses, so the 7000 series or the 10 or 12000 series, we're printing on all different devices and getting the same basic color match which we're mm -hmm. talking about here all based on that spectrophotometer capability. Now, I'm going to, um, you know, you said match, you know, and I'm going to go same paper because um, from, you know, in just in a, in a box of paper, you can have sure. variations in color and when it, on a web roll, my God, I learned to Drupa that oh. the middle of it could be totally different than, than the end of it. So, um, you know, that just has to be a factor, but Again, okay, match is exactly like what he said. It's same visual right. capability, but what you're looking at with the system, the spectrophotometer is going to do an IT8 chart on all the different media. We call it a media fingerprint. Okay. So within a certain tolerance, yes, they're not all going to be exactly exact, but if we're going back to that archer function, that archer is going to shoot, and now you're going to have wind, and now you're not going to have wind, and now you're going to have some other type of uh, generic in uh, in, uh, interference with whatever you're trying to do. So within a certain tolerance, you're going to be within a certain control of that. Okay. I'm going to start this next question with, for, with Canon. I personally refer to paper as a technology, but it's also a color. How are you educating printers and their customers about new substrate options and the best practices when it comes to using specialty inks with your devices? And also, what have you learned along the way that could save printers and designers a lot of time and a lot of money? Uh, okay, so I'm going to answer the last bit first. Okay, so what have I learned that I can impart this tiny little bit of wisdom to others to save themselves time and money? Discipline. Um, there's the, the the throw it in design and wing it phase has kind of got to come to an end in my in, in my mm, very personal view of the universe um, being that there isn't really a stripper anymore and no one's really separating my files for I mean eh, oftentimes prepress is a function of the guy who's I think there's plenty of strippers in Tampa I'm um, just sorry so you know. wrong, wrong city wrong, okay. wrong term um, showing my age <laughs> um, <laughs> 
uh, when you get into the guy who used to strip film, you know him, you know him, that guy who fixed everything, um, they're gone, right? The, the discipline and the art of what of that piece of prepress is uh, sadly missing. So we, on the design side, uh, and I'm fortunate enough to be married to a lovely designer uh, who tells me when I'm being unrealistic about uh, how, <laughs> how disciplined I want folks to be when they create things. Um, and I've been working on this, this line for a few years. It's, it's true. Um, there's a difference between clipping creativity and being and, and developing a process to develop how you're doing what you're doing. So that's that's the little tidbit of wisdom: uh, is take a look at what our friends at Adobe are doing in their products and in the current revisions, and watch what happens. And use the preflight tool that's in InDesign, please. Um, use the preflight tools that are in, uh, in Acrobat, please, um, so you know what you're sending to the print companies before you do it. Regarding the educating folks on media, uh, it's a it's ever so slightly premature that I'm going to mention this um, that we're. We're working very closely with um, the paper companies here in the States in particular to start this program. Um, and we're actually having those representatives work with our sales force and work with our technical teams so they can impart their wisdom and experience with their media. We're sharing parameters between so that they know what they're building for us and building a, uh, a graded system that says these papers work better than those papers and here's our experience. and here's. Here's some educational tools on how you adjust our equipment as an operator, because our goal is really to put that in the operator's hands so they can take the most advantage of it. So there are programs around those pieces, and that's, again, something else we've learned over the past few years is to empower the users with the tools and not make it so big and scary. And Thanks so much. Xerox? So when I work with uh, vendors, especially those that have multiple locations, oddly enough, one of the first recommendations is to try to come up with the common source of the printer or the paper you're buying. Uh, it's amazing how many, uh, especially those that have multiple, let's say, uh, regional regions or regional printers, they're actually buying, quote unquote, identical paper, but they're sourcing it from different locations. And it may read reasonably close as far as whether it might be white point, but there are variations uh, that show up in uniformity. And matter of fact, some actually do vary in white point more than others. So oddly enough, I really it's really important to start with the basics. Try to source the paper from the same vendor where possible. In many cases, you'll get a discount because most folks are being able to ship certainly nationwide or in the case of Europe, uh, you know, continent-wide. The other thing is, I, uh, folks really, when I talk to a lot of these uh, customers, they have a lot of attributes that they're picking for media. And obviously, color is one, but it's just one. Uh, so we certainly work with them in, in helping to select the right papers. And what we do is identify what are called paper groups, so that they're able to understand certain medias that behave in a similar fashion uh, in the printing process whether it be how they're handled through in finishing or of course uh, through color because actually how you're actually rending onto the media can actually impact how they go through the, even the finishing process. Um, the other key thing is uh, the, the UV additives in the paper that they understand how to actually institute a color management process that handles the, pro the UV uh, uh, component in the paper. Um, I'll, and I'll tell you there's uh, and what you don't want to do is walk up into a customer and start to explain about something called M0, M1, M2. Uh, that's not what we want to do. All the uh, color geeks are cracking up at whatever you just said. Because they know. Yeah. And, and some customers have heard it, but like, I don't care. And the color, that's why you want to pick, and again, with our Xerox Integrated Plus solution, it's all about getting that total print condition. It takes into account the media, the UV additives, the UV uh, properties of the inks or not, and potentially even all the way down through the finishing process. So you really need to take all those elements into account because what you're delivering is not just a stack of paper, it's a finished piece. And finishing and whether how much clear coating you're doing or how you're actually uh, uh, going through the print process has an impact on the finished piece because you're going to fold it. Uh, so that's really our focus is to get a finished piece the way they want it. Thanks so much. HP, what have you learned along the way that could save printers and designers time and money when it comes to ink? So this is probably going to get me in trouble, but unfortunately the operator is the lowest common denominator. <laughs> yep. um, so the print gold standard is still offset. 
is, always has been, probably always will be. And as digital vendors, we're up here trying to accomplish something that is, it's been around 50, 60, 70 years in the kind of way that it is today. The problem is, as was mentioned already, the skill set and the mentality of the operators has gone dramatically downhill. And what you find is that nobody understands color. If you said stripper, people do think the other stripper. They don't think about an old white-haired guy that works on film and plates. I don't have if you said dot etcher, they wouldn't have a clue what you mean. If you talk about cyan balance or any of those other kind of things, they really don't know what any of that stuff means. So at the end of the day, how do you get the same kind of quality output from a green button push? There's going to have to be a lot of automation. And from the HP side of it specifically, what we've ended up doing is we've said, okay, I honestly can't trust the operator. So I can't trust the operator to do their calibrations, number one. I can't trust the operator to make good common sense choices in those calibrations. So if you have like operator side and non-operator side, they have to make a choice between one through eight on both sides. I can't be sure that they're gonna choose the correct number or just say, well, it's a four on the front, let's choose four on the back, even though it's supposed to be a seven. So what we've done in the system is we put an inline scanner in the machine and all of the calibrations come out and the machine makes its own choices for its own quality standards. So we've taken the operator in some cases out of the mix. Here's the problem with that. You can't take the operator out completely because there are some things that they need to be able to do and some things they want to be able to do. <laughs> Pantone colors, I've got them right here. If I put them in front of everybody, despite the metamer, uh, metamerism that's inherent in the lights and everything else, two different people are gonna see the colors differently, even in the same color environment in the same paper. I have to have that operator still have some capability to do what they wanna do. So that's gonna be all the way through the product. On one hand, you take them out of it. On the other hand, you give them a little leeway to do what they need to do to get the job done. Jim, and then we are going to wrap it up. Sure, what tips have you, do you have that could save designers and printers time and money when it comes to color uh, use and I guess color management in your case? Excellent, so I, I keep coming back to custom profiles and the reason I keep coming back to custom profiles is a canned profile has to be made, someone else used the, the term lowest common denominator. A canned profile has to be made to the lowest common denominator. Well, what does that mean? In a few months, it's going to be 20 below zero where I live and very, very dry, no humidity. And it's, it could still be 80 degrees and humid down here. And um, an inkjet printer is going to behave very, very differently in those two environments. So you have to set what, what we call ink restrictions, which is the maximum amount of ink that it's allowed to print. You have to set that at a level that will work in both of those environments. Now, on the other hand, if, if if I build my profile for where I live, and I might build too, I might have a winter profile and a summer profile because I get the same weather in the summer, um, then I'm using the exact amount, correct amount of ink for my environmental conditions. Okay, so you're gonna say, well, in one of those environmental conditions, I'm gonna use more ink. I'm like, yeah, so what? I'm gonna, that means I'm gonna be delivering a print with a more vibrant appearance that my customers are gonna be happier with and it's still going to have that nice neutral gray that we talked about if I did a G7 calibration underneath it. It's just going to have a potentially bigger gamut, and it might not. So you, you, you asked about the designer side. Well, if we, treat, if we train our designers, and it came from the other end of the table, I don't remember which gentleman, if we train our designers how to use the tools in Creative Suite, the color management tools that are, I mean, Creative Suite has a really, really deep, set of, of color management tools that are not that complicated to use if you just know a few simple things. So if we train our designers how to set the correct um, output intent for their files, in other words, that, that profile that you tag the image with, if we, if we train them how to tag it correctly, well then it doesn't matter how much, what my primary ink restriction is because it's going to output it to match the condition that I picked in Photoshop. So the designers can actually get what they asked for. Thanks so much, and thanks to everybody on the panel. This has been very informative. Color is the new black, as I say. So um, thank you very much, and you can get in touch with Canon, Muto, HP, and Xerox. Uh, they're pretty easy to find. Uh, it's not like Joe the vendor. Uh, so thanks so much, everybody, and we have another panel coming up in 10 minutes. So I really appreciate your time. See you in a few.